author of 10 books, including uh, one of my favorite topics, the, um, the great agnostic Robert Ingersoll and American Free Thought. She is a frequent contributor to national magazines and newspapers and the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2000, a 2001 appointment as a fellow of the New York Public Library Center for Scholars and Writers. She is a member of the advisory boards of the Secular Coalition for America and the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Her, one of her latest books is Never Say Die, The Myth and Marketing of the New Old Age. She also has a new short subject audiobook from Amazon, which I recommend, about the post-World War II Mad Men generation, appropriately titled The Last Men on Top. <laughs> Today, she will be speaking about the secular conscience. Please join me in a warm welcome for Ms. Susan Jacoby. Thank you very much. Uh, I must say, I, I am completely impressed by this turnout, because when I got up this morning, I thought, why would anybody leave their house? It's been so cold. But we were lucky with the weather. At least it's not snowing. The wind isn't blowing. This is good. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'll, oh, 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 I should also say, for those of you who brought books for me to sign, I will be available to do that afterwards. Uh, uh, First, I'd like to say that although this speech is titled The Secular Conscience, since you're the Red Bank humanists and not the Red Bank atheists, it's going to go out in the world for the rest of its life on the speaker's podium as the conscience of an atheist. You people are my guinea pigs. Uh, so I'm just going to go on from here and use the A word, since just about everything I have to say on this subject applies to humanists, secularists, freethinkers, or whatever we call ourselves. Uh, and although I wrote this speech to try it out on you as a template for this year, as usual, uh, I have to put a new lead on it with the bad news, of course, from France. Uh, let me add to what was said earlier that in addition to being upset by the news itself, which obviously every decent person is, I'm equally upset, actually outraged, by the news coverage in which every liberal journalist has felt obliged to say that the cartoons published in Charlie are vulgar and deeply offensive to religious Muslims, but of course, that doesn't justify the killing of cartoonists. Please. Uh, uh, I wasn't going to get to this till later in the speech, but part of the conscience of an atheist or humanist is that free expression is an absolute right, regardless of who is offended. Religion is not privileged in this regard any more than any kind of politics is that there's something special about doing a cartoon or writing something that offends somebody's religion as opposed to politics. It is the price we pay for the benefits of a democratic society, and I am utterly disgusted at the apologetic tone of a lot of what I've heard on MSNBC and the New York Times, and I think all these people should be ashamed of, uh, of, of making sure that they distance themselves. Well, well, of course, I would never write such a vulgar cartoon, but of course they have a right to do it. Uh, uh, they've forgotten, for instance, what Daumier's cartoons were like. Uh, they, were, they were extremely vulgar. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, to add that. Now, in my experience, the question most frequently asked of atheists in one form or another is, how can there be any morality without religion? This putative question is really an accusation, meaning if you don't believe in religion, you believe in nothing. So there's nothing to prevent you from doing anything. Of course, this is only another version of Dostoevsky's famous formulation that without God, everything is permitted. Uh, however, I never encountered that big question accusation in my personal life until Freethinkers, A History of American Secularism was published in 2004. I was being interviewed by Michael Medved, one of the many uh, neoconservatives who rediscovered his inner Orthodox Jew, along with Ayn Rand as part of his flight from the 60s. And, and, and he asked me, what's to stop you from committing a murder if you don't believe in God? 
Now, I mentioned this incident in a recent review in the New York Times Magazine of Phil Zuckerman's book, Living the Secular Life. Now, I, I have to say, as I said in the paper, that I was taken aback by the question. It was the first time it had been asked, partly because Freethinkers has very little to say about atheism, since it's mostly about the 18th century. Uh, and the numerous secularists among the revolutionary founders were not atheists, but deists, though deists were often called atheists by their antagonists. But the truth is, I was flummoxed by the question. It seemed so ridiculous that I just blurted out, well, it's actually never occurred to me to commit murder. And it's true. Uh, like everyone who has ever been married or in love, the words, I, I'd like to kill you, have undoubtedly, I'm sorry to say, escaped my lips. But truly, I didn't really mean it. It was only in the spirit of a six-year-old saying to your little brother, which my brother told me, I also said, I wish you were dead. Uh, I may have felt strongly enough to voice the sentiment at the time, but I certainly had no intention of doing it. Really, I swear it on the origin of species. Uh, indeed, one of the greatest mistakes of Catholic theology is equating thoughts with deeds. Thoughts are not deeds. What's to prevent me from killing anyone, apart from a distaste for blood shared by people who aren't psychotic, is human empathy plain and simple. I wouldn't like anyone to kill me, and so I can imagine how you would feel if I tried to kill you. It would probably hurt, and at the very least, it would mean the extinction of the consciousness that's what makes us human. It's the golden rule as expressed in one way by Jesus and another way by Hill. And one may not believe in life after death, need not believe in life after death or vengeance from beyond the grave, to see the desirability in purely natural terms of not doing unto others as you would not have them do unto you. That's actually the Judaic formulation as opposed to the Christian, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the Judaic admonition makes more sense, I think, because it doesn't rest on the assumption that everyone else wants exactly what you want. I mean, your idea of erotic pleasure may be being tickled by a feather, but it doesn't mean that I like to be tickled. So if you do unto me as you would have me do unto you in that respect, you're making an assumption that might get your face slapped or result in an ooh instead of an ah. I should say, though, that this exception only applies to matters of taste as in sex or food. The golden rule in either way, positive or negative formulation, is completely valid for big offenses like murder because no sane person wants to be murdered or tortured. Uh, to turn this discussion away from the frivolous feather, what people of extreme faith generally mean when they talk about the incompatibility of morality and atheism is that atheism makes it more difficult for them to impose their particular brand of religion-based morality on everyone else. For instance, all societies, religious and non-religious, do indeed have prohibitions against murder. They have them for the reason I've already mentioned. Being murdered is not a pleasant experience for everyone. And the murder prohibition also exists uh, because revenge killing is not an effective way of ending the disputes that crop up in any human environment. Settling feuds by blood vengeance leads to more blood vengeance. And that, not any particular form of belief in a supernatural being who rewards or punishes, is the reason that all societies have laws and punishments against murder. If the fear of God alone could keep human beings from doing that, we wouldn't need earthly laws and earthly courts. Most people's violent impulses are kept in check by hardwired empathy. But for those who lie beyond that circle of empathy, and they exist in every society, there have to be laws forbidding assault and murder. And that applies just as much to atheist psychos as it does to religious psychos. <laughs> but although every society prohibits murder, societies define murder in very different ways. And disagreement over the definition of murder lies at the core assertion that there, of the assertion that there can be no morality without religion. We've seen this for a very long time in the abortion debate in the United States. If abortion is murder, as the religious Christian right contends, then it ought to be illegal. But many people, religious and non-religious, do not consider abortion murder because they do not consider embryos 
or fetuses, human beings, with the legal rights of born persons. We see the same definitional problem in the debate over physician-assisted suicide and, in general, over the right to die. If human beings have no right to decide in any circumstances, any circumstances, to end their own lives, then of course physician-assisted suicide is murder. Unassisted suicide is murder too, literally self-murder. The idea that only God has the right to decide when it is time for his creatures to die is rooted in every monotheistic religion. It is the reason a Christian who killed himself or herself could not be buried in consecrated ground until well into the 20th century. But as an atheist and a humanist, I believe that people do have the right to determine the conditions under which they wish to continue to exist. Uh, to turn to another moral definitional question about murder, killing in combat is generally not considered murder, though some religious groups, such as Quakers, disagree with that. In many parts of the Islamic world, so-called honor killings are not considered murder, but a justified restoration of the prestige and honor of families by extinguishing the lives of women who have, quote, dishonored their relatives by being raped, or even by choosing a partner of whom the family disapproves. This represents morality as every bit as much of the judgment of a society in which rapists, not their victims, are the ones who are supposed to be public, punished. It's just a different moral judgment, a diametrically opposed one as it happens. One of the most common mistakes people make in everyday speech is equating morals or morality with goodness. But many forms of morality, say the socio political system imposed by ISIS are based on what I consider pure evil. So when religious people assert that there can be no morality without religion, what many of them mean is that there can be no morality of which they approve without the dominance of their religion. You might just as well ask whether morality, there can be morality with religion. The world's great religions disagree significantly on a wide variety of moral and ethical questions. Contrary to the, again, assertion by a lot of mealy-mouthed religious liberals that all religions have the same principles. Actually, they have some of the same principles, but not all of the same principles. And if religions disagree on something as fundamental to human order as to what constitutes a murder, one can hardly expect any religion to be the last word on less important matters such as money lending or sodomy, you know, to take two things uh, which, uh, which are used quite often uh, in the Bible and misused today. Uh, you might well ask why I'm beginning a talk titled The Conscience of an Atheist for the Discussion of Law. But really, law can only be seen as an expression of collective conscience, that is to say, governing on those matters in which in a democratic society enough people agree to enact a public prohibition. And laws that give expression to this collective conscience change as public opinion changes, as we've seen most recently in the shifting statutes regarding gay rights and gay marriage, as well as marijuana. Now, what the religious right in this country says is that the laws on gay rights can never be changed by human opinion because they are God's laws laid down for his own reasons, which reason knows nothing up of. When you talk about this with fundamentalist religious believers of whatever faith, the first thing they hurl at you is a term of opprobrium after they've finished asking you what's to stop you from committing murder, and that term is moral relativist. I think that there are many atheists who actually don't understand what certain believers think and why they think it about moral relativism. There's a great example of this in my friend Rebecca Goldstein's novel titled 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, which I highly recommend to you. In one chapter, Goldstein depicts a fictional debate between a religious believer and her hero, a man named Cass Seltzer, which I just think is a funny name, uh, who has written a book called The Varieties of Religious Illusion and been described by Time magazine as the atheist with a soul. I love that title, by the way. It's so Time magazine, past and present. Anyway, the religious believer in Ms. Goldstein's novel declares in a long speech that there's simply no way for an atheist to claim any sort of objective morality. Cass Seltzer, this is still the 
believers speaking. Cass Seltzer spoke of the tragedy of a child being exterminated by the absolute evil that was Nazism. But how, coming from his relativist worldview, can he possibly maintain there's anything like absolute evil? If it's on the basis of evil in this world that he argues that our world yields empirical evidence against God's existence. But the absolute distinction between good and evil can only be maintained on the basis of God. According to the Nazi system, it was perfectly okay to send a child to his death. And without God, who's to say that the Nazis were wrong? Uh, then he, then he goes on and he says, now Cass Seltzer, of course, is not a Nazi. He has another system from which he judges the Nazi's action wrong, the suffering inflicted on a child. But it's just, if it's just some people's systems going up against other people's systems with no higher authority to decide between them, then it all dissolves into moral chaos and ethical relativism. I can talk, again, this blowhard goes out talking, I can talk about morality, but only because I know there's a God who establishes the objective difference between right and wrong actions. Between immoral systems like Nazism and moral systems like Judeo-Christian ethics. Now, the problem with this argument, which one hears in one form or another from all extreme religious believers, is that it never deals with the question of exactly how a human being gets to know God's will. <laughs> and since no one else is ever around when God actually talks to people, <laughs> whether it's directly from the burning bush or indirectly as when the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith a few thousand years later in upstate New York and handed down the Book of Mormon. I'm going to tell you, I've been to the very spot where it was supposed to have happened. <laughs> the reasons are always, of course, what people say God's reasons are. Just as the reasoning behind secular morality is formulated by human beings. The difference is that an atheist or a humanist, at least this atheist, is willing to admit this. What I am revealing also in my critique of this response is that I'm not a philosopher, unlike Rebecca, who is. Uh, I'm interested in evidence, not in logic about the supposedly independent reasons of supernatural beings or even of secular philosophical thought systems. Show me a picture, at least before Photoshop, of Moroni descending from the sky and flying off before there was any mechanical way to fly, and maybe I'll consider your independent godly reasons. And I would have considered them before Photoshop. Uh, Plato's allegory of the cave makes sense because it proceeds not from abstract philosophy, but from a natural phenomenon that can be seen and understood by anyone. It's why it's still around in every history as well as every philosophy course. All moral arguments boil down to one person's value system against another's, and that doesn't make them any less serious or consequential than moral arguments conducted by one group of people claiming to speak for one god and another group of people claiming to speak for another god. What I should have asked Mr. Medvedev, it's so, it's so great to think years later of what you should have said, is what's to stop you from committing murder if your god orders it? He's done that in the past. In fact, he did it at the founding of your religion. And of course, the answer is that Abraham would have gone ahead and murdered Isaac if God, that prankster, had recanted at the last minute and said, I really didn't mean it. I just wanted to see if you'd obey me and do it. The story of Abraham is reason enough for my reservations about the good without God cam campaigns that many atheists and humanists organize, uh, usually around Christmas and Hanukkah time. There is certainly no more reason that I should have to prove to you that I can be good without God as there is for you to prove to me that you can be good with God, that you're no blind follower. I'm quite willing to accept that most religious believers aren't Abraham and wouldn't take it on faith, really, if God told them to kill their sons. If they don't take it upon themselves to ask me to explain why I'm not a murderer because I don't believe in God. None of these observations, however, address themselves to the question of how the conscience of an atheist or a humanist is or isn't formed. I should say at the outset that I'm not a moral relativist. If this term means some, what it usually does, which is a person who believes in no moral absolutes. When I've just said that moral disagreements are always disagreements between groups of people, 
I didn't mean that some of those people aren't right and some of them aren't wrong. The statement that according to the Nazi system, what the Nazis did was okay, is meaningless because the Nazi system, its concept of human beings and of the proper relationship between the state and human beings was absolutely evil. And not because there is a God who says to, who allows it to go on anyway because his creatures supposedly have free will, but because any sane person who possesses any empathy can see that the killings of dozens or hundreds of thousands, or in this case, millions of human beings, is absolutely wrong, regardless of whatever system, religious or secular, says it is right. How do we know this? We know it simply by opening our eyes and seeing the pain and suffering of the damned. So the first essential point about the conscience of an atheist is because it is formed by natural means, by observation and experience, it cannot contradict the laws of nature by being based on what is unseen, inexperienced, unexperienced, and therefore not supportable. To par paraphrase David Hume, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. That people are capable of looking at pain and suffering and doing nothing about it, sometimes for centuries or millennia, is an example of the interference of religious and ideological faith, faith with conscience based on naturalism. Slavery, a human institution that significant numbers of people began to question only 300 years ago, is a perfect example. Uh, slavery, something which was supported by all religions, all religions at various points in their history. Anyone with a brain and eyes to see can see that people of different colors from different parts of the earth are all human beings, walking upright on two legs, possessing the gift of language, capable of communicating their suffering through that gift. Yet all of the sacred books of the major monotheistic religions, written as they were millennia or centuries ago, justify the practice of slavery. And this religious justification interfered for a long time with the natural perception that a person I claim to own is another human being. Now, it's also true that there are many writings in the same sacred books that can be used against slavery. But it took centuries of human progress, much of involving the realization that these books were written by human beings. And so the meaning of these passages is not, you should excuse the expression, written in stone. It took time for people to begin questioning the notion that some human beings should have dominion over others, as God was also said to have given man dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And of course, there are secular ideologies that bear the same distinguishing marks of the most orthodox forms of religion, which is imperviousness to evidence. Lysenkoist biology in the Soviet Union, for example, which insisted that it was possible to alter human beings genetically to shape a homo sovieticus by changing their social conditions is the perfect example. Scientists who insisted on maintaining their loyalty to Mendelian genetics were sent to the Gulag, and Soviet agriculture and medicine were set back three generations. Lysenkoism, a part of the brand of Marxism practiced under Stalin, was impervious to scientific evidence in the same fashion that Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, is impervious to evidence that human beings do not arise from the dead. And in the same sense that radical Islam is as impervious as Christianity used to be to any evidence that women are, after all, human beings and not inferior to men. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton once said, what power is it that makes the Hindu woman burn herself upon the funeral pier of her husband? Her religion. What holds the Turkish woman in the harem? Her religion. Man of himself could not do this, but when he declares, thus saith the Lord, of course he can do it. So as long as the ministers stand up and tell us that Christ is the head of the church, so is man the head of women. How are we to break the change which have held women down through the ages?" Unquote. So, the essential precinct of the conscience of an atheist is that all beliefs and communions are subject to evidentiary challenge. If someone does a double-blind study on the possibilities of resurrection 
and can, can conclude to me that the formerly dead are alive and appearing on both Fox News and MSNBC, well, then I'll have to revise my conclusions about life after death. I'm very open to that. I really do feel that some of these people are undead. Uh, the premise that all conclusions are all conclusions are open to evidentiary challenge is not moral relativism, because the fact that there is much we don't know is just that. It's a fact, not a belief. We know a whole lot more example, infinitely more, uh, for example, about humanity's ge genetic makeup than we did in 1945, the year I was born. Before DNA was unraveled, we certainly knew that some diseases were inherited, based, based, on, based, based both on the observation that some diseases ran in families and also on some inspired guesses. But we didn't really understand how that worked, and the possibility of any intervention was nil. And some of the things we thought about what was and was not inherited were wrong. Uh, before the breaking of the genetic code, for instance, we didn't have at all an idea of what was genetically transmitted and what was the result of some outside intervention during pregnancy. Even something as basic and related to both heredity and environment as height, which we now know has as much to do with nutrition as genetics, we didn't know about. Uh, so inevitably, our growing knowledge about what is and is not indisputably genetically inherited has changed our view on moral and legal responsibility. No reasonable person or court, for example, can assign full moral responsibility for an impulsive crime to someone who has Huntington's disease, which is characterized by violent impulsivity in the middle stages before the person loses all mental control and is incapable of doing anything. Thus, the second most important premise in the conscience of an atheist, in my view, is that all of us who do not suffer from pathological mental diseases have to act as if we have free will, regardless of whether we do or not. I know that some of you in the audience may not agree with me, and we can have some discussion about that. Uh, uh, there are, in fact, quite a few atheists who disagree with me about this, which is why this talk is entitled The Conscience of an Atheist and not The Conscience of the Atheist. My friend Sam Harris, for example, has been writing a good deal about this on his blog, and there is no question that neurobiological research is beginning to suggest that our wills are perhaps more circumscribed than any of us like to think. This may very well turn out to be true, but in terms of the moral issues that we confront every day in our own lives and in the collective life of our society, the scope of free will is so broad that it almost renders the question of whether it really exists in a neurological sense irrelevant, in my view. Uh, it is certainly true that the notion that we have no free will in the very broadest biological sense is as deep a wound to the human ego as Darwin's theory of evolution was in the 19th century. All of us, atheists and religious believers alike, take pride in our concept of ourselves as free agents, able to choose not only between right and wrong, but between good and the greater good, and between evil and lesser evil. Whether this pride is ultimately justified by scientists, science doesn't matter, in my view, because we're all obliged to act as if we have free will in making moral choices. It's rather like the open question of whether human beings are the highest point in evolution, or whether there are some creatures out there beyond our galaxy who are a lot smarter than we are. My own reason and my knowledge of science at this stage it tells me it's actually unlikely that our planet is the only chunk of the universe on which intelligent life has ever developed. So the scenario in Invasion of the Body Snatchers could be possible. But it's really not useful for me to keep this thought in the forefront of my mind and let it influence my actions, because there's so much I have to do and humans have to do as a species that it really doesn't matter whether the body snatchers are on their way to Earth or not. And that's pretty much how I feel about the issue of free will. Did the Nazis have no free will? Really. It really doesn't matter, because we can't live in our world, whether there are other beings in other worlds or not, and permit a system like Nazism to run things. And if I'm Bernie Madoff, let's say, and I decide to cheat people out of their life savings, 
it really doesn't matter whether my thought greed process goes back in some great neurobiological chain to some origin I can't perceive. Did I have to do what I did? The law can't ask that question except in the coarsest sense of clinical insanity because human beings, just like we can't live in a system in which the Nazis run things, we can't live in a society in which Bernie Madoffs are free to operate without a penalty. Now, I'm very mindful here that free will is the excuse the religious use to justify the ways of God to man. It's how they solve the theodicy problem. Yes, God is all powerful and all good, but because he's endowed man with free will, he's off the hook for both the Nazis and the males. <laughs> not, not by me. An atheist doesn't have to let anyone or anything off because we don't believe that the universe is intelligently designed. So we have to take things as we find them and exercise our intellectual faculties for what we perceive as the good. Of course, that word perceive raises the whole issue of moral relativism again. But we're all bound by what our senses can perceive and our brains can at least try to understand. In fact, the struggle to understand is always moral as well as intellectual. Uh, and it's harder, I think, for an atheist because it's easier to fall back on the it's a mystery, eternal life uh, explanation. If you can wind up just saying, it's a mystery, then you don't have to keep on asking the questions. I think the most tempting words in the Christian Bible are Paul's. For now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now we know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. There's an old spiritual that says the same thing. Farther along, we'll know more about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. I can easily understand why this belief would provide comfort in the unending ethical dilemmas that life poses, because an atheist has to make moral decisions without that comfort. Further along, I won't know more about anything because I'll be dead. The brief span of consciousness that makes up the arc of my human life will be extinguished. Extinguished. So, what seems to me the third indispensable formation of, in the element in the formation of an atheist conscience is certainly a form of utilitarianism, and is just as easily expressed in the biblical aphor aphorism by their fruits he shall know them as by John Stuart Mill. Uh, Sam Harris and other modern philosophers call this consequentialism. Now, Sam acknowledges that basing our moral decision only on consequences raises lots of questions. One of these, obviously, is the law of unintended consequences. You know, try as we might, we can never know the full scope of the consequences that proceed from a decision at any given point. Take that classic question of whether to save a baby or a Rembrandt from a burning museum, and my answer is no one should have to make that choice because people who go to museums should get a babysitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the answer to that question, I dare say, is obvious to anyone but, but Adolf Hitler. You save the life of the living, not what was the artistic product of a life that ended long ago. But what if the baby grows up to be Adolf Hitler? Well, obviously, there's no way of knowing that at the moment you're rescuing the baby from the burning building. So it is quite clear that making moral decisions on a consequentialist or utilitarian basis is neither easy nor foolproof. But it doesn't mean that that isn't the best possible basis for making it. Uh, the reason I'm not a moral relativist is that while it is not possible to make a fully correct evaluation of future consequences, it is certainly possible to see what the consequences are and have been of various kinds of moral decision-making and systems in the past. We can look today, for example, at the lives of women in theocratic Islamist societies and condemn their treatment of women not only on the basis of enlightenment values, but on the basis of what we can see about the miserable lives that women lead in those societies. Are these societies processed, prosperous? Are either women or men educated enough to enjoy the benefits and standard of living that people in more secular, AKA, developed societies enjoy today? Does it contribute to personal happiness for a woman to be shut up in her house from childhood, prevented from going to school unless she's brave enough to risk having acid thrown at her, sold in marriage as a young teenager to men who rape her, and subject to the death penalty if she falls in love with someone her father hasn't chosen for? 
we don't need to know all of the future consequences of this sort of ethical system because we know what the consequences have been so far. That is what I, why I have no use at all for what I consider multiculturalist liberals run amok, who say that we have no right to make judgments about other cultures and religions. Sure we do. We can make judgments on the basis of the lives we see people living in those societies now, not on something written a thousand years ago or something that might happen a thousand years from now. In the final analysis, though, the irreducible element underlying the conscience of an atheist is our acceptance that death is the end. This both complicates and simplifies moral issues, but I think that the understandable human refusal to accept finality is one reason so many atheists still prefer to call themselves agnostics. Some famous 19th century freethinkers and agnostics turned to spiritualism as they aged because they couldn't face what an atheist must face about death. Susan B. Anthony, for example, wrote in her diary, if it is true that we die like the flower, leaving behind only the fragrance, what a delusion the race has been in, what a dream is the life of man. I've never understood this point of view, less still from a person who devoted her life, though she didn't live to see the result, to affecting such a fundamental change as gaining the right to vote for women. The older I get, quite naturally, the more tragic and misguided I consider this view of morality, even though I dare say it is probably a majority point of view. As a writer, I certainly like to think that a century from now, someone will pick up one of my books in a library, or digital archive, and learn something about American intellectual history that can't be learned from any other book. I've had this experience many times when I've unearthed books and, and written by free thinkers in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, you could certainly say, and I freely admit, the longing for literary or at least scholarly immortality is a form of vainglorious thinking. It's quite clear to anyone who isn't delusional that not everyone can leave his or her personal name on a piece of the past. Whether that piece involves language or literally something concrete, like a bridge, and yet you don't have to be the designer of a bridge, the person whose name is known, to have left your mark. I've often thought that when I've walked across the Brooklyn Bridge, that many now anonymous men died to erect this wonderful structure. Part of them is literally beneath our feet. But let us put aside even those things that last, at least temporarily. Let's even put aside children who are most people's immortality and their lifeline and stake in the future. What we all do in trying to live meaningful in lives in an ethical sense is important in and of itself. Even if the person who is the object of one's most profound solicitude is the only one who knows it, and even if that knowledge dies with that individual's death, what if we do die like a flower, leaving only a faint and transient scent behind? It's much better than leaving a stench behind, <laughs> even though the stench, too, is temporary, unless it was exuded by human beings of great worldly influence. Whether our actions are remembered on a larger stage, for how long and by whom, is not the foundation or rationale for living what might be called the good life. The moral rightness or wrongness of our actions can no more be evaluated by how they will be judged in the future than how they will be judged by a god in the afterlife. Susan B. Anthony could not have been more wrong. It is our acceptance that this life is all there is not our expectations of immortality and perfect understanding eternity that give our lives moral meaning. Now, a few of you, and I see who you are, who have heard me speak before, know that I rarely talk about my personal life. I keep that for my books, and I don't do much of that in my books either. However, I'm going to make an exception at this point because it is so pertinent to, what I, pertinent to what I mean when I say that I think acceptance of the finality of death is crucial to the conscience of an atheist. Seven years ago, my longtime partner died of cancer. He had Alzheimer's disease, but fortunately the cancer killed him before he entered the final stages in which all cognition and consciousness are destroyed. During the last months of his life, I often wrote him letters, but he, because he found it easier, he could still read to, at that point to absorb things that were written down rather than spoken. 
This isn't true of everyone with Alzheimer's, by the way, but it was true of him. Here is an excerpt from a letter I wrote him after he, we had gone to a movie. As it turned out, the last movie he would ever see. And this, this is the letter excerpt from it I wrote. Only a few weeks ago when we saw the movie starting out in the evening, the one starring Frank Langella, I was deeply moved by a line in which he described his love for his former wife. She lived in my heart, he said, and I never found that again. Well, you were the only person who has ever really lived in my heart. And that will be true long after you're gone, until my last moment of consciousness on this earth. We don't believe in life after death, you and I. And we, we're not, we know we're not going to meet someday again in a place with puffy clouds and harps. Although if there were such a place, I would like Harpo Marx playing the harp. <laughs> we have no children together, so the memory of the love we have won't go on in that way either. But I deeply believe that love is never wasted. And whatever good comes from it, we've passed on in some way to others. In everything from books to perhaps a greater tenderness that either of us might have shown without the other. Now we have only the moments of time we have, and we must use them as best we can. I'm glad I saved a copy of this letter, because it brings back to me all of the conversations he and I had during those last month, months while the light of his mind was dimming but not extinguished. I know that the memory of what I was able to do to help him rests only with me, well, a small part of it now with you. But it doesn't matter. It seems to me that the very essence of the atheist and humanist concept of morality, a concept limited to what we can do on earth, is that love is never wasted even though it is not eternal. Our acts, good and evil, become a part of the world that will continue after us as long as the world endures. As Darwin said at the end of his great work, there is a grandeur in this view of life. But there's also a proportional humility in this view of life. The knowledge that this is our one and only life, a span between unconsciousness that precedes and follows our short existence, lies at the heart of the atheist and humanist conscious, conscience. Thank you. myself as an experimental psychologist and a determinist. Could you tell me, when you use the term free will, of what is your will free? That, well, that's the, that's the question. Uh, that, that's, in fact, the question that, that neurobiological research is, is, is trying to answer. Uh, what my will is free of is, first of all, the illusion that there is some higher authority. Uh, to whom I have to answer and that my actions should all be determined by that. I think in that sense, I, I, that's, that's probably something that most humanist psychologists or not can agree on. Uh, the que what, what my will is not free of, obviously, is what my genetic endowment from my parents is. My will, my will is not free of, for instance, I, I rather agree with those who think that that probably probably uh, willpower as a uh, means to effective dieting probably uh, doesn't work all that well. <laughs> that uh, that probably one of the things that my will isn't free of because of a lot of things and they may not be genetic is a, is a desire for sugary things for the chocolate that I, if I were alone I would probably be popping into my mouth right now. It's getting late in the morning, <laughs> um, but. What my will is free from is being shaped by an outside authority. Whether it is free from, you know, whether in fact you had to do what you did is something if you go far back enough you can prove, I don't know. I rather think one of the reasons I think the neurobiological research on free will is a little bit fruitless is it's like to prove that man doesn't have free will. It's the old problem of proving a negative. And while there are some negatives you can prove, like, like I can test a drug on you and prove that you don't respond to it, but when the field, as in field theory, is as big as the whole question of free will, 
I don't think, you know, it, in other words, this is a negative that's so big that can't be proved. Although I, I would be willing to say that, that our wills are probably less free than, than any of us would like to think we have. And in the sense that free will, you can say, for instance, that people, one of the things that I consider most stupid, sort of, is the way we revere people who resist torture, who don't break under torture. One of the things John McCain says that's true is that everyone breaks under torture, uh, including himself. Uh, whether, you, whether they break in a way that gives any useful information is an entirely separate question. So our wills are also not free in a certain sense if the real extreme pain is applied to us. But again, that, that's kind of a large field. That's not what most of us, the, but then you go on and say, well, my will isn't free because I'd lose my job if I speak out about this or that. Well, that seems to me, so it's always a matter of drawing a line. I won't, I'm ans answering too long, because it's a, it's a good question and a complicated one. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, the word you ended on, complicated, all of this is very complicated, and that we're in the process of challenging and questioning rather than thinking anybody has arrived at anything is always a good thing to keep in mind. <coughs> and um, one of the things that um, in my life experience, um, it seems to me that law uh, hasn't always been that helpful because law has become about regulations and isn't really based on what is ethical or looking at consequences in particular situations and looking at also what is violation. Um, I think that uh, perhaps um, <laughs> I just want to share. Where's the question? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it really is a comment, and what I'm thanking you for is opening up, um, being part of uh, those out there who question and open up question for all. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Well, I, I, I would, would kind of like to make, even though it wasn't a question, I'd like to make a comment on that. Uh, while everything is open to question in the sense in the sense, in the theoretical sense, there are a lot of things I think that aren't open to question in a practical sense. And in those, I would, I would simply include all of those things I spoke about in which we can see the results. Uh, I think that there are lots of things in history that we can see from the results of what happened that 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 they really that they really aren't open to question. That slavery is a bad thing, I don't think is open to question. I think that we know enough as time goes on, we accumulate enough evidence about what certain kinds of social practices do to people that it's not really open to question. I yeah, I wouldn't for a minute say if if you could bring me, you know, some kind of a some kind of a videotape of a society in which there are happy slaves. And I'm sure there are people who thought that and who, if there had been videotape in this country 150 years ago, would have brought it to you. But I think that there are some things that aren't open to question. And what I really disagree with you about is law not being useful, which is not to say that there aren't unjust laws. Uh, and, and changing them is a, a, is a big part of civic responsibility. But laws are not just based on regulation, they're based on ethical beliefs. And as ethical beliefs change, law changes. But as I was, well, the reason I talk so much about law and murder is, is, that, is that I don't think anyone would say there shouldn't be laws against murder. It's only a question of what do we, you know, what do we consider a murder. So I, don't, I think law is actually, is actually very important. Uh, the problem you have with laws is when they become an expression of one group in society's views as opposed to something resulting from consensus, although consensus laws can be bad too. Uh, I, I, I per ter certainly agree with people who say that if you put the Bill of Rights up for a vote, that it might, they might not pass in the United States. <laughs> Two quick questions for you. First one is the easy one. What do you consider the uh, best survey of American intellectual thought? Uh, 
now or or 50 years ago? Either, just uh, your favorites. Oh, Richard Hofstadter's Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, which is one of the few one of the few books I think that really holds up over time. I think that uh, uh, one of, one of the mistakes he didn't make in 1961, which is a mistake practically everybody else made, is he didn't think that fundamentalist religion was over. And boy, was he right. Uh, in general, people thought then, in the 60s, that all of this stuff that we're still dealing with today was, uh, was, was fading away. So I, I, you know, I would have to say that, that I consider, if I would read one book about American intellectual life, it would, it would probably, probably be that. Wonderful. That is you. easy. <laughs> How about so? Uh, we've also discussed some of the nationalist um, contexts in free thought here this morning. The examples of Nazi Germany, so on and so forth. How would you react to the argument that America is a Christian nation that you hear so much today? That's easy, too. <laughs> They're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the argument that America is a Christian nation is based on what's actually a, a pretty simple-minded misapprehension of history. America, when it was founded, was overwhelmingly a Christian people as America still is, in fact, in spite of the existence of more minorities and more people who don't adhere to any religion. Nevertheless, it is still a majority nation of people who possess some form of Christianity. It is not a Christian government or, you know, we, say we, we are still a majority Christian people, but this has never been a Christian government, and, there, and that is what is meant by a Christian nation. Uh, if America had been founded as a Christian nation, the founders would have said so in the Constitution. And as we all know, although almost none of the college kids I lecture to know, the Constitution does not mention God. And in the 19th century, this came up many times, but most significantly during the Civil War, when a bunch of Protestant ministers called the National Reform Association went to Abraham Lincoln and asked him, as there had been many movements previously in the 19th century, to substitute not just God, but Jesus Christ for we the people as the source of all governmental power. And Lincoln, who was really casually, he said, I'll take such action on this as my responsibility to my maker and my duty to my office demand. Uh, his action was to take no action at all. It's all. All he needed during the Civil War was a fight about making Jesus the head of the government. Uh, but. I mean, there, there's an interesting coda to this story, which is, this is actually how In God We Trust first got on the halfpenny coin, because some people in Congress thought it would be a great idea to shut these people up, to do something that would make them happy, that wouldn't require an amendment to the Constitution. And so in 1864, In God We Trust appears for the first time on any American coin, on the half penny coin, and that's how we, we went down this road. Uh, uh, the vast majority of Americans think in God we trust is in the Constitution, who was there for the beginning. But what it was, it, it, was a, it was a bone thrown to these ministers so they would shut up about a constitutional amendment replacing we the people with Jesus. Right here. Uh, your book, uh, Age of American Unreason, was picked for our latest um, book club that we have here at the Red Bank Humanist. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I read it in, in that book or whether I saw it on YouTube. However, do you agree with Richard uh, Dawkins that religion is dangerous? Uh, I happen to believe that it is. Just like polio is dangerous, yet you 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 feel that I should have uh, I have I should have a vaccine to eliminate polio, yet you don't feel that um, you know religion is it, religion is dangerous. I I don't I don't feel there is a remedy. It, there is a remedy, and that's the ERA to the United States Constitution. That's the remedy. Confused about why you feel that. Uh, we, you know, that polio and 
disease is dangerous, but you don't feel that religion is dangerous and they should should be eliminated. <laughs> actually, actually, Richard Dawkins doesn't exactly feel that way. I think that there are all kinds of religion that are very dangerous. Uh, do I think? Do I think that most that liberal Catholicism, Reformed Judaism, and I think religions are dangerous to the point that people make absolute truth claims that would deny other people's rights. But do I think do I think that the that the Reformed Jewish temples I'm asked to speak in all the time do I think that they're dangerous because I don't believe in some of the things that they believe in? No, I don't. I think the statement that religion is dangerous it's just one of the peculiarities uh, to which human beings are heirs. And uh, if there could if there there is a vaccine against religion. The vaccine against religion is more free speech challenging the idea of supernatural belief. Any vaccine, uh, we, we have already tried to eliminate religion. Every society that has had religions with united with governmental power, with absolute truth claims, has tried to eliminate other religions. Uh, but any attempt, any attempt to eliminate all religion uh, would certainly be far worse than if you consider religion a disease itself. But I don't consider it a disease any more than I consider a lot of other things. There are all kinds of people who believe, you could even say this is a form of religion, there are people who, uh, who believe that they, can, that they can commune with the spirits of dead people they've loved. I think they're crazy, I think they're wrong, but I don't think, I don't think for the most part that this is a dangerous belief, but I certainly don't think in a democratic society that stamping out something that answers a human need as broad as religion apparently does. Uh, let's face it, uh, we are the minority in this country, and even to some extent, even in, even in Europe, while atheist, for instance, is not a word with a pejorative connotation in Europe, and, and, and I'd be willing to bet you today at the rally in France that French politicians aren't going on and on about God and how wonderful he is uh, there as, as they would be here. You know, they end their speeches with Vive la France, not God bless France. Uh, but, but do I think that all religion is dangerous? No. I don't, and I, don't, I particularly don't agree with Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins which is that moderate religion, and they do believe this and have written it, moderate religion is even more dangerous than far right-wing fundamentalist religion because it's a respectable stalking horse for the worst kind of religion. I think that that is historically inaccurate. What we have seen, as indeed orthodox preachers predicted in the 19th century, is the more, let us say, Christianity liberalized the more also religion fell away as a big force in our society. I think far from liberal religion being a stalking horse for the worst forms of religion, I think it is much more likely to lead to a secular mindset. I think that the, uh, I think that the popes and, uh, and their blasts against secularism in the 19th century, I think they were absolutely right. It's why also, I have a new book which won't be out for a year because I just turned the manuscript. It's called A Secular History of Religious Conversion. It's about all of the non-spiritual factors that enter into conversion on a large scale. Uh, one, of them, one of them being intermarriage. And well, the nuns of my childhood were absolutely right. They didn't want anybody, anybody in Catholic school to date non-Catholics because they said that'll lead to Catholics falling away from the church. And they were 100% right, it did. Uh, intermarriage always leads to somebody falling away from some church. It's very rare in an intermarriage that both people keep whatever, whatever their beliefs were before. And, and that, that, also, that also would apply to atheists. I, I, I actually... I have trouble in my chapters on America. I have never been able to understand, although I know many people here, I've never been able to understand the kind of intermarriage in which 
people think so they're apparently one of the most popular form solutions to bringing up children in your marriage is an intermarried couple decides to pick a third religion. There is even, I can, which I find utterly bizarre. There is even a good example of this. Uh, Harry Reid, the former Senate Majority Leader, uh, is married to a woman who was born Jewish. You know, they're from Nevada. You know, heavy Mormon political influence there. When Harry and his wife got married, I mean, her parents were not very happy about this. Harry was just brought up as an ordinary Protestant, not as a Mormon. And you know they had, you know they had wanted her to marry a nice Jewish boy, and they decided. And and she gave a long interview to the New Yorker magazine. They decided that they would pick a third religion, Mormonism, and they would both convert to it. Uh, this seems to me to be utterly bizarre. This notion of the religious marketplace is strictly American. It's not a phrase you hear anywhere in the world, as though it, it is something like, you know, pick one from column A and one from column B. Uh, I, certainly that kind of intermarriage, I mean, that must really be, but while her, while her parents were alive, Harry said, they keep a mezuzah on the door. But when they died, I guess they took the mezuzah off the door. But I mean, th this, this seems to me to be bizarre, and when people say, uh, oh, it's almost a, saying the value isn't important. I, for instance, definitely could not raise children with someone who wasn't an atheist. Uh, not because I think there's anything wrong with not being an atheist, but because I could not possibly allow a child of mine to be raised with beliefs in supernatural beings in which I don't believe they're dangerous, but I, I'm not about to bring a child of mine up. So I would naturally pick a husband or a partner who shares my beliefs. Now I know all about falling in love and people can, and I've never had the misfortune of, and I don't see how I could, of falling in love with somebody, you know, who has devout religious beliefs. But if I did, I think certainly the religious and atheists are equally right to raise the question of, well, really, do you want to raise your child with someone who believes something? Because I don't, when I say I don't believe that much religion is dangerous, that doesn't mean that I would want to raise a child of mine with it any more than I would want to, for instance, I don't believe that uh, ballet is dangerous. But I would not be happy, actually, although certainly I would allow it, how could I not? I would not be happy with somebody who wanted to just go to ballet school from the age of nine, or, or wanted, to, wanted to do what my mother once fantasized for me, which was to train on the ice 10 hours a day to be an Olympic figure skating champion. <laughs> not because I think it's dangerous, because it's just not what I think is right. Well, religion is a lot more important than that. Uh, uh, how do you feel about this comment? If you did not have God to forgive you for all your sins when you died, would you still act the same? Would you, yeah. still, would, would you still do the same thing if there wasn't a God to forgive you for all your sins when you died? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, are you asking me that question or are you asking uh, what I think of the question? I'm asking what you think of the question. <laughs> um, I, well, first of all, it's a question that applies to very few people because there are many religions that don't believe that God is going to forgive you for all of your sins when you die. In fact, this is one difference, it's one of the difference between, I won't say Catholicism today because a Catholic today, they are as varied as, uh, as, as, as indeed humanists are. But there are, one of the differences between Catholic theology in its traditional sense and, uh, and many kinds of Protestant theology was the possibility of absolute forgiveness, even if you repented at, only at the last minute, uh, exists in the Catholic Church, but not in most Protestant churches, and not in Judaism either. Just repenting, just repenting and going to confession, there is no such thing in Judaism of whatever, of whatever branch. There is no such thing in many forms of Protestantism, though not all. And, and then there is also, uh, I, actually, I think it's an idiotic question. <laughs> because, because, because the fact is, is the majority of people, religious and non-religious, don't believe God is going to forgive them automatically for all of their sins when they, 
when they die. Even, well, even the Catholics, of, of course, one of the differences between Protestantism and Catholicism is Catholics did and still do have purgatory, which is the halfway house, in which you get punished some more if you're really bad, but not bad enough to condemn you to, condemn you to hell. I can't, I don't know uh, what, I'm sure Islam is like Christianity in that there are many forms of beliefs about that. But I, but I, uh, I, I don't think that most modern religious people believe that God automatically forgives them for their sins if they die. In, in fact, automatically, I, I think never. But there, there's a possibility of a God who forgiving you for your sins when you die. Well, I, 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 I just don't see the question, and I actually don't think whatever people say. Uh, the, the jails wouldn't be full of, the majority of people in jails are Christian believers in America, and there are a lot of people in jails, in jail, who, are, who, who in America, and the majority of them are Christians. If religion were in any way sufficient to make people not do bad things, uh, there wouldn't be any of those people in prison. They, because there, are very, there just aren't very many religions that believe in automatic forgiveness of, of sin. Although it is true that there are a few, like traditional Catholicism, which believe there is no sin too great for God to forgive. In fact, that's one of the, thing, one of the rationale was used by those disgraceful people among the Catholic Church, in clergy who helped Nazis escape. You keep returning to Nazis, it's just he who helped them escape from Germany to South America after the war. That well maybe, you know, they'll be a lot better, they'll be a lot nicer. Eventually they'll be sorry for what they did. Certainly they would be sorry if they didn't escape. Right. Moving back to the trouble with determinism and free will, as I understand it, the trouble with determinism is that determinism interferes with the idea of free will, which interferes with the idea of liability for our actions. Um, earlier in your speech, you raised the topic of Nazi Germany and the actions taken by the Nazis. Determinism would interfere with their liability for their actions because if we had held a determinist point of view, that would mean that their genetics, their environment, they, those yeah. are responsible for their choices. But that would mean that if um, situations outside of their control were responsible for their choices, they could not be held liable for whatever immoral action they take. My question is, is there any way that biological determinism and legal liability for immoral actions can coexist? Um, not if you make biological determinism the law. Uh, there's certainly, there is certainly, there is certainly a way that belief in a larger degree of biological determinism than people have traditionally thought possible. And I gave the example of Huntington's disease because we know that there are some cases in which there obviously is biological determinism that does override traditional notions of liability. Uh, although this is an accepted since, uh, since the Supreme Court, although lower courts have disagreed, believes that, that it's okay to execute someone who is clinically insane, uh, to apply capital punishment to them. But I don't think that there is any way, except in extreme individual cases, in which the biological determinism is obvious, and obviously the result of a pathological process, that, that we can ever absolve people of liability. And since we, we in fact, there, there is no evidence, and nobody is going to find it in the lifetime of anyone in this room, of a biological determinism that can be established in a way that would be acceptable. It would have to be a biological determinism that could be proven by the usual rules of evidence in a court of law. So I don't think I don't think that the question ever arises, except when there's a narrow field like a like a particular disease that we know. For instance, somebody in the end stages of Alzheimer's disease cannot be held responsible for their for their actions. They literally do not know what they're doing. But these are these are rare cases, and they can hardly be applied to a whole society. And the fact that I think an even more interesting question is the fact that uh, that people believe they are right about something, uh, that they sincerely believe it. These are this is a defense that 
they tried to use in the case of assassins of doctors who perform abortions, that because it is their religious belief that it's privileged under the First Amendment, American juries have had no, including juries composed of people who are opposed to abortion, have no sympathy for that. And, and in a sense, my answer to your question would be, no, they're not compatible, but, but there is no way we're going to establish biological determinism in any way that any, anybody could agree, because we cannot live, one thing is certain, biological determinism or no, we cannot live in a society in which people are just absolved of responsibility for their actions. We can't, none of us can live in it. <coughs> Was it the nuns who turned you into an atheist? <laughs> or was there a particular event, book, or friend when you didn't see the light? Um, I, think, I think certainly that having a Catholic education played... I became an atheist quite young. I was really aware from the time I was about 13 that I did not believe in God. Uh, but I think that having a Catholic education did influence me in one way, and the Catholic education I had was the Catholic education of the 1950s, which was far more orthodox than you would receive at a Catholic school today. Uh, it just didn't make sense to me, that's all. So because I was exposed to more religion, I think I thought about these things more at a younger age than I would have. Just as things like, uh, you know, when, when you would ask the nuns about the Holy Trinity, that's the, that, the great theological issue for which so many died in Europe over so many centuries, the nature of the Holy Trinity. And, you know, you know, what they would do is they would hold up a shamrock and say, it's like a shamrock. You know, they're, they're like a shamrock has three leaves, but it's one shamrock. So, too, there are three persons in one God. And, you know, and my immediate thought was, what about a four-leaf clover? I mean, why not four persons in one day? I'm not making this up, because I asked the question in class, and, and the priest called my mother up <laughs> and, and said, well, uh, you know, I think that your daughter is just trying to, this, is, this was a phrase that was used particularly by nuns in 50s Catholicism, she's trying to be, uh, too much of an individualist. I, and this was a bad word. I have, a, I have a friend who's a former nun who said this was used constantly in convents too at that time. And, uh, and, and my mother said, well, you know, we've always taught our children that they have a right to think for themselves, which actually was not a typical parental answer to a priest in 1950s Catholicism. But I think the amount of religion I was exposed to as a child, it made me more curious about it. And I think that that, that led me to atheism and it led my best friend for a couple of years to being a nun. I, I think that, that those things had something to do with it. But mostly, I think it was just thinking. I think probably, probably the biggest influence on me was reading Anne Frank's diary when I was 11. I still have it. It's the first paperback book I ever bought. It cost me 25 cents. And she said, I, I still believe that people are really good at heart. And I read that and I thought, why does she think that? <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I really, it had a big influence on me. And also, uh, uh, some of you in this room are old enough to remember when, when the Eichmann trial, parts of it were televised on what was then the short evening news. But the Eichmann trial uh, was much discussed in my house, and a lot of information came out that had not come out at the time of the Nuremberg trials, which, of course, I was too young to you know, have any memory of uh, anyway. But the Eichmann trial and the scale of it and, and what people were capable of doing and its incompatibility with the kind of God I was taught about in school. I was 15 then. But I think that, I think, look, I think always for atheists it's the theodicy problem in one form or another, and, and the atheist just can never, can never say, well, you know, you know, 
farther along we'll know more about it. it it's a mystery. And, and also, and also, God must have his reasons. That was a phrase I heard a million times when I was, God must have his reasons. We can't expect to understand them. I don't think for anybody who calls themselves whether a humanist, an atheist, a free thinker, agnostic, God must have his reasons. Well, then he's doing a very bad job of showing them to me. I think that, 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 that that's part of it. And I think for faith, when you have devout religious belief, you ultimately have to accept that, that God has his reasons that you cannot, as a human being, expect to know. And that is the religious answer to that question. Um, we're going to have two more questions. It's, it's almost noon. If, uh, if everyone could just be patient for the last two questions. Thanks. <laughs> It's been said that uh, there is a direct correlation between uh, the decline of religion overall and the uh, rise of uh, crimes both in the streets and in the suites. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? And uh, secondly, uh, is there any uh, rule of thumb beyond the immediate uh, selfish utilitarianism to... Uh, selfish, I'm sorry, I didn't hear catch that word. Uh, selfish uh, utilitarianism. Uh, in, in deciding on, uh, on ethical uh, thorny issues beyond uh, the extreme cases of life or death. I and see. finally, finally, uh, is there any chance that, that we have a black president and soon possibly a woman president? Is there any chance that an atheist would become what they president in this country? I'll answer the last one first. Thank you. There is, there is no way in the lifetime of anyone in this room in America that a self-declared atheist is going to become president. I think we may have had an atheist or two as president in the 19th century, but there is no way that anybody who comes out and says, I am an atheist, and, and the public opinion polling, by the way, uh, back, backs that up. Uh, being an atheist is, is worse uh, by an overwhelming majority in the minds of Americans than being a black or being a homosexual or being a Jew, or and whether they're telling the truth about these other people and whether they would vote for them or not, uh, I think that you know the different the differential is. And now, I've, unfortunately, I've forgotten your first question <laughs> because it was such a long. The, the, the relation between religion and decline of uh, oh morality. oh oh yes, I wanted to answer that. First of all, I don't know what makes you think that crime has gone up. In fact, violent crime throughout the United States is at an all-time low. Now, I certainly wouldn't say that's because of the decline of religion. I mean, there's no causality, but there's no evidence at all that, that, crime, has, that crime has gone up. Uh, the kind of crime we're most scared of, which is everything from armed robbery to murder, has gone down. It's gone down in every major American city. It's gone down in every large metropolitan area as, as formal adherence to religion uh, uh, has gone down. So I don't know where you get the idea that crime has increased. Uh, what about the Swiss Madoffs and the like the CEOs, yeah. the politicians, uh, and the corruption to prevent? All right, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that because there's one more question and, it, and it's too long. But I, I don't think there's any more evidence that there are any more Bernie Madoffs today than there ever were. Mm. Mm. All right, here, last question. Yeah. Susan, the speech you gave us today. Is that available? Would that be available on your blog or anywhere? Uh, first of all, I don't have a blog. I have, but I will. I will have one. One of my things I'm going to do in the next two months is bring my website into the 21st century. Uh, but it's not going to be available for a while because I'm. I told you, you're my test case for this speech. I'm working on it and tinkering with it. So it will be eventually will be on my website, which is SusanJacoby.com. And when you go to it, you'll see what an awful website it is and how much it needs to be upgraded and brought into this millennium, actually. Uh, and, uh, but it will eventually be on it, but not right away, because I want to tinker with it uh, and, and try it out. Uh, so you know, you'll get the point two version of this the next speech I'm giving in March. <laughs> so you sort of, you're my first audience for this kind of new speech for this year. Thank you very much. All right, so thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.